maybe she can yeah. put it, hook it up to her con her television. How's that? Is that better? I keep looking over and I'm like, oh, I can't look Perfect. over because then they'll get funny views. I have to make sure I look All at right. you. All right. <clears throat> put, tell her to put the skinny filter on. She is. Okay, good. Oh, she did. Good. She did that first. All right, great. Yep, all taken care We're of. We're all set then. Yep. What We're else is set. there? All right. Well, hello world. It's me, Dennis, and I am here with Sharon Houseman Cohen and Carol Village. Village. I like Village better. Good. Anyway, because right? that's right. Mm -hmm. Because it's right. That's right. <laughs> anyway. We're going to be talking <coughs> science, and we're going to be talking about the evolution and the, and the leading edge of what these two women, what you're doing, doctor, you two, and you're, and you're a practitioner, an energy practitioner, and work with the mind-body connection, and you two are starting, on, you have started a company called? Intellix DNA. Intellix DNA. Doesn't that sound interesting? That's an interesting place to start. So tell me the history of this and how did you get that name? Why don't you tell the history of our name, Carol? Okay, um, so we started out, we were looking for lots of different names and trying to decide how we could put the description of what we do in of our, inside of our name so that it would be less problematic for most people. Exactly, in yeah. something that is such a leading edge. Right, and we came up with a name we loved. It was called In-Depth DNA meaning we were taking a deep look or a deep dive inside of DNA, inside of the science of DNA, to better understand how someone might be affected by their genome. Right. And we loved that name, but unfortunately someone else also loved that name. And during the trademark period, those people were applying as we were applying. And so oh. theirs came out a week before ours did, and they have in-depth genomics, I think, is the name of that company. Right. And they already had funding. They had a whole lot of other things that we hadn't gotten to yet. And so we relinquished that name yeah. and quickly had to come up with another name. And so we went out for dinner. Actually, we were celebrating my, my youngest son's birthday. And I said, let's have a brainstorm session about a new name. And so, you know, a couple of margaritas were involved. And uh, we came up with <laughs> A few names, and I said, we should just call ourselves Two Dumb Chicks DNA. And, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I thought that was hilarious. Yeah. And Sharon kind of looked at me like, mm, I don't like to be nah. called dumb. So <laughs> 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 and so we, you know, we pondered a little bit more and came up with intelligent. Right. And uh, we liked that part, but we didn't want it to be intelligent DNA. And so we started thinking about it a little bit more, and we liked the chicks. Part. Yes. And we thought, well, chicks kind of sounds like two X's, two X chromosomes, yeah. two women, intelligent women, DNA. So, intellix DNA. Oh, that is a wonderful origin story. That is terrific. Thank you for letting her mm -hmm. telling it. That's, and you, you got un your understanding of it as a doctor, as a physician, as an understanding in the science of it. What? What attracted you here? What did you say, wait a minute, this is important for us to be able to... Well, I've been in the field of genomics indirectly and directly for a number of decades. When yes. I was, I, I started out going to graduate school, not medical school, um, many years ago. I went to yep. Harvard initially to do a PhD in medicine, and part of the research I had done had been with genomes, and sure. um, in those days we were calling it something different, um, but still looking at uh, the effects of different DNA and DNA mutations or variations. So it had always been an interest of mine, and we had been using over the past decade in our practice single little changes in the DNA to get a better understanding of some specific issues. So um, there's a gene called MTHFR. Some people think it stands for mother, father. Some people think it stands for many mm -hmm. other things. Yes. But it can have, it actually stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. Don't say that of three times course, fast. Of course, of course. But <laughs> we were using that because it would have a big implication in things like depression. Yes. Um, we were using certain other genes with relationship to cardiology. But 
we weren't using them all together. We were kind of using one gene at a time. Now, when you use that, when you say the word using, what does that mean? How do you use it? That's a great question. So, for example, in that one, which is probably one of the most famous genes, MTHFR, yeah. it's the ability to take folic acid, which is from leafy greens, yes. and convert it to a form that can get into the brain. Mm -hmm. And that methylated form that gets into the brain is what's needed in order to make the brain chemicals that help with mood and memory. And so knowing people who were inefficient at making that form of the methylfolate would allow us to help them need less medicines for depression because we could just give them methylfolate so they could better make their own neurotransmitters or brain chemicals like serotonin and wow. norepinephrine. So, so if, if you see that in my, in my DNA, mm -hmm. then do you repair that in the DNA or does it, or, or do you just find ways to, to compensate for it's, it's not? Mm -hmm. You go ahead. Okay, so basically, so the technology to repair it it's coming, that's CRISPR, that's a gene editing, but that's not what we're doing. That's still really, really an early right. experiment. What we're saying is that gene allows you to make methylfolate, which is kind right. of like saying, you know, which is one of the ingredients for making, the, the brain chemical serotonin is what Prozac and Zoloft and those kind of common antidepressants work on, sure. but they just recycle them. And what we're saying is, well, wouldn't it be better if you could make more on your own rather than having to use drugs? So we just give people methylfolate or we give them riboflavin because that helps that gene work. Right. So by understanding what's going on with a person's uh, DNA, we can then give them targeted supplements and vitamins and things like that to help so them. So it really gives you a tool, a diagnostic tool. And when you're talking about, because you deal with mind-body connection mm -hmm. in your practice as a practitioner, right? Can yes. you talk about your practice? Sure. I do what's called integrative manual therapy. So I take a whole host of different types of modalities, including what's called visceral manipulation or lymphatic drainage therapy, and in a medical setting, provide <clears throat> the body's impetus and opportunity to heal on its own. So if I note that something isn't functioning at a high level of, um, uh, well, a function, sure. then I try to increase that function. And if I can't, I try to find out what may be complicating that. And that's the same as what's happening in the genome. We're looking at a variety of things. Mm -hmm. We're not looking at just one gene because it, and this is an important point, I think, too, is that when you're looking at different genomic concerns, no one product is the same as any other product. Right. Each company picks what they want to look at. And so you really can't compare <laughs> one product to another product. You can right. only compare what is this product offering and is it the same as this other one and how do they do it? And that's a very different thing as well. So. Uh, going back to the mind-body, if I can understand that there is a component that the mind is controlling over the body and it's a somatic issue, mm -hmm. then I'm going to attend to that in a somatic way. If it's more of a physiological aspect of function or dysfunction that's affecting the mind, then I'm going to go that direction. So, so when we use that term, because psychosomatic has gotten such a pejorative Meaning when it really isn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really does bring that together, doesn't it, as, as the mind and body, if, as I understand it? Yes, it absolutely does. I mean, we are absolutely pulled in directions by our thoughts and by our physical experiences. Yeah. So tell me about the journey. I, would, I could talk about that for hours with you, and I will. Uh, <laughs> the, the, but talk about the journey in, as a business people as sitting there and saying, we are going to go out and, so tell me your business model, tell me what it works, how it works, what, 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 what you're thinking about. So what happened is uh, I, had, I was in private practice, but in a little bit more of a traditional model mm -hmm. um, with insurance and not necessarily 15 minute visits. We tried to give as much time as we could. And I was attracting very complicated medical patients that wanted me, people who wanted me to untangle their medical mysteries. You mean human beings? Human beings that oh, weren't just like yeah, so, each so now, other. Now I get it. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, go ahead. So people wanted that help, and we decided that that was something, and um, 
that was something that I really wanted to do, that I had the skills to be able to help the people who maybe had not gotten the help from the traditional medical system. And at, so I switched to a practice that was a little different practice model mm -hmm. that allowed me to have, it was a concierge practice. Carol and I co-founded it because we realized there was so much more we could do together. Sometimes the different techniques that she used um, yeah. with chronic pain, with all kinds of issues were so, uh, added such an important additive effect. And also Carol was a fabulous researcher. And so we joined forces and created this new practice called Resilient Health. Mm -hmm. um, which was really fun, and we thought that was going to be kind of the yeah. end of it. We did. Yes. We did. That, think that 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 would However, been, that, 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 that would have been enough. Yeah. Would have been say, You want to? You tell God your plan. Uh, right. Her, yeah. Right. So that's there's a yeah saying enough. We thought that was enough, but then what people were coming to us with was their DNA because 23andMe was popular by this point. Yes. And mm -hmm. they were saying, I have a family history of Alzheimer's, or I have a family history of heart disease. Can you use my DNA? to help me prevent heart disease and Alzheimer's and a host of other things. Well, we were actually doing that already before people were bringing in their 23andMe because both of us being researchers were delving into the published literature in uh, the National Institutes of Health and looking for clues, as we call them, to guide us. But at that point, it wasn't about the genomics. It was more about symptomatology and the diagnostics that were available. And, and so we began looking at different components in addition to those pieces. We brought in the genomics. And so as we started looking at each individual SNP, which is a piece of that DNA, um, we learned, oh, this is connected to this, and this is connected to this, and this is connected to this. And that's why a person might have uh, a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. As opposed to what is a an event, a genetic event, chronic diseases are not a one gene type of event. Sure. There's no heart disease gene. There's no diabetes gene. There's no, even, there's no one gene that gives you Alzheimer's. Um, there, well, there, there are in some very rare cases, an like early form Absolutely. of Alzheimer's, but, but the majority. Mm -hmm. And so when we started looking at those different diseases, we said, well, let's, like, for example, with heart disease, we found that although there were maybe a hundred different genes that might contribute a little bit, increase your risk 8% mm -hmm. or 5%, there were a smaller set of genes that we knew what they did that had significant increase on risk, 20%, 200%, oh, right. so get 70%. That. We, we need to work on the ones that, that could, the greatest risk factor. Right. right. So the first thing we did is kind of map out which ones had some of the most significant risk factors. Mm -hmm. And then we went into the literature and said, well, what can we do about it? So if there's a gene that causes hardening of the arteries, calcium to build up in the sure. walls, we said, what can be done? And then we were able to go through the literature, prove that on that pathway, vitamin K2 can help block that from happening. And so, but if you have inflammation, which is a big source of heart disease and brain inflammation and diabetes, almost every chronic disease, that's going to be a different set of interventions. And why there are medicines that work on those genes, if someone's using something for prevention or they just don't want to use medicines, they're going to be more interested in the fact that curcumin, which is from turmeric, or sulforaphane from broccoli sprouts extract, or different things like that, um, there's something called resolvins from trout, can all address those inflammatory pathways. And so we matched up the genes with the interventions, but we also then went to the level of saying, okay, we're only gonna put curcumin in the cardiac panel, like with the cardiac genes as an intervention, if there's studies showing that curcumin reduces cardiac disease. And so that's kind of how we built yeah. this. The outcomes had to match because wow. otherwise they're not clinically relevant and we are clinicians. Yes. And so if mm -hmm. we just said, well, it might work and you can try this, then that right. would you know, negate the point of having the genomics at all. Yeah. So you have, not only do you have your practice, but you also have your research right. arm there. So how, how do you, so, so do you get together and then and, and have to actually transition into the research? We're always doing research. Right, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, what? We, we kind of joke that we do our practices four days a week and IntelliX DNA four days a week, yeah, um, exactly. and that tends and to the, work. And <laughs> on the ninth day, you rest. That's, That's right. right. So that, <laughs> yeah. But it's uh, we have a research team. 
Yeah. And so uh, we, we have... We do now. We didn't... St it used to be just it two used to of be us. us. Exactly. But, but I w w of course, I mean, you know, Paige and Bryn used to be just the two of them. So, so and then comes Google. So, so that, that's the, the way that... Ha so, so how is it not only progressing at this particular stage, where is it right now as far as your primary your primary audience is your is the practitioner right i mean this is who this is it rather than being the the person in the in the in in their home well we only sell to clinicians we right. are what's called clinical decision support software got it which means um you can't make a decision just based on someone's dna you have right. to include their family history their own medical history yes what their own values, what medicines they're on, all those kinds of things. So yes, our audience is our clinicians, but we really find that right now, because it's kind of like going from the X-ray to the MRI. Now you have all this data. Oh, it's that it, makes it, there's it's right. that much of a it's shift. Such yeah. a huge shift it that it's a very special kind of clinician. So how yeah. is the how is the medical community? Uh, Accepting, resisting, uh, because let me, it's a short story. My niece, who happens to be this uh, very well-known colorectal surgeon, uh, in, and, but, but when she was going through medical school in, uh, the, I think, like the early 2000s or this, this is at a big medical school. She eventually went on to Mayo. But they told her, you have seven minutes okay. from the time yeah. the patient walks in to the time you need to be moving to the next one. That's what the that's the insurance company model in this. So, well, it's definitely d difficult in the seven minute model. It's not that, 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 it, it doesn't happen. That's it, not our target. I, I know. I, that, yeah. That's what I'm saying. But that's what they told the students. But the right. but the idea being is that you're talking about really getting a chance to to spend time and get to know people and get to know. So how is the how is the 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 medical community and the and the just in general and large, mm -hmm. with you guys being on the leading edge, what's the, what's the thought process? I do think that genomics is becoming part of more mainstream language, but not part of mainstream care. And part of that has to do with the insurance model. What time limits the doctor has and the fact that genomics isn't covered by insurance, genomic testing is not covered by insurance, but pharmacogenomics can be. Uh, which has to do yeah, more with the. Uh, so you're seeing little, little, little slivers, little breakages in the. Pharmacogenomics is how a person metabolizes drugs, and so for certain drugs like the, the blood thinner Plavix that's given after someone has a stent, or for tamoxifen or um, Coumadin, there are actually known genes that can affect whether someone needs a little bit, whether they need a lot, whether it's going to work for them or not. That's starting to get into the knowledge base of kind of clinicians in general, oh. but not doing genomics to kind of say, let's use genomics to help untangle Alzheimer's or autism or heart disease or osteoporosis. Right. Right. That is where we're really cutting edge. Are, are, you, are, are you specializing yes. are, are in, 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 a, in, in a direction? Yes. Um, we have consciously focused on chronic illness and those things that are not the one gene disease state. Right. And we have a, a great track record, actually. We've, we've done a lot of really good work with many patients in reversing cognitive decline of various levels using genomics. So wow. we are focusing heavily on that, but we have the other, other reports as well that talk about heart disease, that talks about uh, obesity and macular degeneration and a whole host of other other ones. Diabetes. Diabetes. And, and, um, mm -hmm. and we have, we are currently working on a report to help with the issues of autism. Yes. And which is, again, is not a one gene illness. And so uh, going back to that, that comment that I made earlier is that physicians, I think, are going to be pushed more by the demand of consumers because the information's already available to them uh, by these consumer products and so many self hackers or biohackers are affecting their health either in the right way or in the wrong way not knowing and then frustrated and get upset that they can't get the effect that they're looking for and go looking for doctors who can help them with these issues and wonderful. so 
we're looking for and are creating a stable of we are training many doctors across the country so that they can learn how to use genomics in practice. And you were asking about our target, you know, like who are the doctors that are doing this? Right. And what we found, we initially reached out to a lot of different kinds of doctors, and the ones that have really embraced this tend to be doctors that are trained in functional or integrative medicine mm -hmm. that have practices that allow them to spend a lot of time with their patients. Right. And that they're generally at a stage of life where that's what they want to do. And so it's the two big groups we found are doctors who have already had kind of their first career mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have seen the benefits of medicine but not had it meet all their patients needs yeah. they then have become trained in integrative and functional sure. medicine because of course that wasn't around 30 years ago or 20 no. years ago no. um, but they tend to be very what I would call high-end doctors yeah. uh, the previous dean of the Mayo Medical Clinic um, exactly. school the Mayo Medical School um, the person who took over the clinic for Dr. Perlmutter in mm -hmm. Naples, Florida. So oh. uh, we have you know doctors that have really good reputations across the country, which is an exciting group of doctors to work with because we all Isn't learn it? from each other. So how do we, <clears throat> I know it must be hard to be at this place and sit there and go, okay, here's the need, here's the seven billion population <laughs> in the world, and here's the distance between here and there. How do, how do you keep keep your eye on the ball with a, and and then but also still seeing of this ha, this has to be something that that can can be done in Nairobi uh, that can be done sure. in Kiev and can be done in in Bastrop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we we first when I first uh, was at a conference and speaking, um, people came up to Carol and I from all over the world because it was an international conference. And we actually they thought about where that. Our world headquarters. Yes, they asked where our world headquarters. Exactly. Exactly. Like, <laughs> we're like, we're like car, right here in the table. Right. <laughs> Come on over to the Honda. We'll be over here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and we were just starting at that time, and we actually had to make a decision. Uh, so we right now our goal is to get make sure we have doctors in every state that are trained, and that's oh. our first goal. And we have, Beautiful. you know, there's some states we have a lot of doctors in, and there's some states we're still working on, uh, and then. Our next goal is to then look at where else there's more need. So we do also have doctors and people trained in Australia because we have a PhD that works with us. Uh, she's been the lead researcher on our autism report. So we know the need to get it across the world, but we're, we're taking baby steps because it's a big, a big undertaking to get people trained. It, 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 this is a huge, I mean, to, to know that you're on the leading edge of what is going to be changing and impacting all of us in the time. I mean, it's... It, I it, like what he just said. That, yeah. That. You know, and because it's, it, it, it's, an extra, it's an extraordinary extraordinary experience about to be, to be able to be there. And then just to, to, to keep after it every day and to be learning. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we are literally going from looking at what medicine was, bloodletting, and doing the, the work we're doing, and then knowing that each time we're learning and, and learning about what this, it's an extraordinary experience that you, you guys are going through. Thank you, thank you. Where are, so, so what, what are the, the misunderstandings about genomics and, and DNA that, that people have that, that can be cleared up? How, help me in my, in, in my ignorance. Uh, well, I'll start, but then I'll, I'll pass the baton. There's a lot of popular information about genetics and genomics mm -hmm. that certainly contains certain pieces of truth, but they don't always bring out the same outcome. Got it. So we talked a little bit about, do you compare this product to this product? You really can't do that because as I said, each company chooses what they are going to be attending to in the mm -hmm. genome. I mean, there are a lot of genes in there. And so there are companies that focus on cancer. There are companies that focus on the one gene problem. Mm -hmm. And then there are companies that focus on things that provide small levels of insight, but nothing necessarily as to what to do about it. And then there are companies like ours that have particular models that we're following. Okay, so we're looking at the chronic disease model and how can we affect that? But how can we do it so that we know it's clinically relevant? 
how can we do it so that we know that the outcomes that we're hoping to get will be done by the modifications that we provide. Oh, wonderful. And it's repeatable and scalable. Yes. And I think that in terms of misconceptions, because you had also asked about that, or things that, Please. you know, problems, uh, one, people often don't want to say, I don't want to know my DNA because I right. don't want to know if right. I'm going to get Alzheimer's. And that's probably the biggest misconception because every single thing we look at is a modifiable gene. Right. So even what people call the Alzheimer's gene, APOE4, APOE4 increases the risk threefold with one copy approximately, 12-fold with two copies. But just because you have APOE4 doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's. And that's the whole point of what we're doing is if you know what contributing factors, do you have mitochondrial, which are like little energy producing things inside your cells? Do you have mitochondrial issues? Do you have inflammatory issues? Do you need more choline or more B12 than average? By knowing all those things, you can reverse cognitive impairment many times yes. and you can decrease your risk. So we tell people the DNA is not your destiny, it's your family history. Right. And if you can mm -hmm. know oh. your history, and you know what kind of things your family has a little bit of more, a um, little less resiliency towards and a little more, needs to be a little more careful about that you're more prone to inflammation, well then we can tell you how do you lower inflammation with food and supplements, exercise even. So that's the big thing is DNA is not your destiny, no. it is your book of you. It's like my, it's like my Google map mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that can sit there and just say, exactly. oh, there's a blockage in this way. Here's a, sh here's a shorter exactly way that it. is the exactly. way around that's it. That's fantastic. And, and that's giving, that, that's all you're doing is you're giving us information to be able to, 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 to deal with it. That's right. Correct. That's fantastic. Because mm -hmm. if you learn before you ever have a blood clot in your legs that you are five times higher risk to get blood yep. clots when you travel internationally, well, then you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. Or... Oh. Like, I found out that I don't transport B12 very well because of two gene variants, is what we call them, or SNPs. Mm -hmm. So I don't transport it well into the brain, so I need more B12 than average. So when you learn these things about yourself, then you can optimize. You can really say, well, I want my brain to function optimally. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't mind taking extra B12. Right. And it reduces the fear of getting a certain disease because... First of all, we only report on things that are modifiable. But second, it's an invitation. You're ex getting to Thank explore you. yourself mm -hmm. yep. in ways that you could never do before. No, it, it, it was simple. It was this. I was talking with the CFO of one of the nation's largest uh, hospitals, and he he said, "We cannot survive on the the the." making people who are sick better. Mm -hmm. We have to go from the wellness model. We have to find some way to reward wellness and to reward that. And that's where I see this as really being that opportunity. And, and that's exactly, that is exactly what we're trying to do. So I'm a family physician by training. And a lot of times people say, you're a family physician. That seems like an odd you know, medical director for a genomics company. And I'm like, no, it's perfect. It's, it's right, perfect. Right, yeah. It, it, it is by definition. Prevent. That's right. what it you should know, be. We want to prevent right. things. And so really one of the problems is American medicine has been very reactive. If you are having a heart attack or having a stroke, hospital's a great best place to be. And, no and, and the best care in the world. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if you have a family history of diabetes and heart disease and stroke, people really aren't able to give, doctors aren't trained in giving specific recommendations. And with the tools that Intellix DNA gives a doctor, they can then sit down with you and say, oh, you know, for you, these kinds of foods are really gonna raise your blood sugar more. And if you have more whey protein, or if you take this herb, or you eat less of these foods and more of these foods, we can help prevent you from getting diabetes. Which actually, when, when, we, when we look at it from an economic model, when oh, yeah. we're looking at it from every model, you end up saving billions, trillions. You, you, you really work down when you work on, on, on the wellness model. Right. And Absolutely. it also does, it, it does something else that to me is extremely important. It, it destigmatizes ill health that can't be named. And there are millions of people who are unwell, seriously ill, who just don't have any hope. And they go to doctor after doctor after doctor trying to find care and having to defend themselves. Yes. And that is an extraordinarily frustrating place to be as a patient. But just as a human being, you don't want to be told, oh, 
mm, you know, you might yeah. need to go yep. over there and, you know, talk to those yep. folks. Yep. Yeah. Carol's talking a lot about things like when we have patients who come to us, Carol specializes a lot in pain and fatigue and things like mm -hmm. that. And we'll have someone coming to us with chronic fatigue and they've been told they're depressed. And then we're able to show, look, you don't make CoQ10 well. CoQ10 is the main food for mitochondria that make energy. And you don't remove the different toxins, like things like pesticides, like glyphosates, which is what they spray the crops with. Mm -hmm. um, or a lot, that's kind of an oversimplification. Or sure. you need more of certain vitamins. Or you don't convert thyroid hormone to the active form. And then all of a sudden, they're like, oh, OK. So I, or they may have genes that make that make them more tired that are only found in 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. But when they understand that, then they don't feel so bad. Even with obesity, yep. there are some people who obviously have many more struggles with obesity. And when they understand that their body stores fat much more efficiently, which would have been great if you were starving in Poland, not necessarily so great when you're living in a, an area where you can go to the supermarket and have tons of you know, calories. Did I just have a stroke or did the lights change? The lights change. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad. I, all right, just yes, in case anyone is the, looking over here, but we're, we're going to have this mood lighting. Yes. We're going into the, we're going yes. into the evening yes. portion yes. of the show where we're just relaxing. So if we have, you know, you, you don't need to have a, uh, you know, we'll, we'll serve a little wine and just relax <laughs> as, we're, as, as we're enjoying this. In the last part, now here's one of the, when I was, growing up, and I'm 71 this year in 2019, is that we, we, we're an, an, all right, so we're going to take an edit here, and even though, and then, and, and then they're going to re-get the lights and on, and on, right. on that. I know, I scratched my eye once during it, sorry about yeah, <laughs> it. I'm just so glad, I, I'm just so, just wanted to make sure that, I, that everything was okay. We like the mood lighting, Donna, but we want the wine then. Only if it comes with a bucket full of Silmarin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, we can fix the. Uh, and, and it has. Push an hour. We were going to get close. Um, I got to go out to my. I think I. Uh, One of the things that, that fascinates me is that if I go to the vet and I have a 20 pound dog. They would prescribe by weight, but if I have a 40-pound dog, they prescribe a different amount by weight. But a 110-pound woman and a 240-pound woman, man, uh, I'm not 240, but I was. But anyhow, but why did I even have to say that? It, it, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that it does. I don't see on the side of the medical label, take according to your weight. Why is that? Well, in some drugs they do that with, and other drugs, it's because so there's a a wide range of what can work for someone. But that's exactly the point. Is actually if you dig deeper into someone's genomics, one person might be better off taking. So with um, statins, you hear about people talking about muscle aches from statins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's another topic we cover in our reports. And for some people, they can take you know 40 milligrams of Lipitor every day and they'll be fine or whatever one, Zoco or whatever, or Crestor. For right. other people, because of a gene, they are much slower to break it down. So if they're taking 40 milligrams of Lipitor on day one and they're not breaking it down, by the time it's been in them for two weeks, if their liver isn't able to take it up and break it down effectively, they now have 200, way more than they should be having, and they start to get muscle aches. So we can then take those people and say, wait, this person doesn't break it down, so only give them 10 milligrams of Lipitor and skip Saturday yes. and Sunday. So absolutely genomics and individual differences, not just weight, but differences in the metabolism should be used. Oh, that's terrific. That's so. terrific. It is. Uh, <coughs> what I'm interested in is that, again, how can you see this moving into the medical practice of don't answer that question right now. Mm -hmm. Too interesting. I'm, I I want to I want to mm -hmm. wait till we're on on that. I'm. Uh, how does my mindfulness impact my uh, health? Wow, that is a big question. Um, that's that's a question that we would have to talk about for probably the entire. Uh, 
You should tell them how Here's someone's mood can affect their DNA. I promise you, I, I want to. I, I would love to have more of that conversation. I'd love to have a. I'd love to have a, a session on. Have her uh, back. Where, just where have you back? And 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 we and we we really talk about that because these are the things. Because I'm 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 so interested in. I'm interested in the. Um, and this is the. This is the. Um, This is a great over, oversimplification, so I would rather get this out where we're not on so you can help me. But it appears to me as if we got to find some way to empower nurses, that we can't make enough doctors. But that if there was some way that we could find some way to get, to get nurses and nurse practitioners and this into the system so that we could... Well, we're trying, because what we're doing is so many of the interventions are food, supplements, things like that. Yeah. We actually do make a version for nutritionists, which is a great right. starting place. It won't go as in depth into things like statin intolerance no. or blood clot risk, but it can but absolutely help with bone the... health and blood sugar and obesity, and you know the vitamins that can support the heart health. And so or, that's or a the great brain health, and the right? brain health right. absolutely. The, the nutritionist can do so. The reversal of cognition impairment, uh, reversal of cognitive impairment protocol. We can absolutely have done by but a nutritionist. I love I love the idea of you approaching it from the nutritionist, mm -hmm. to, fr approaching it that way because that way you could get from there into the public that could and do and do some good that moves along that. And it's a little more affordable, mm -hmm. so it's, exactly. So it's it's still a matter of getting enough people trained, and that's kind of the phase that we're in right now. And, is we, and we can see the trajectory. I mean, we have literally hundreds. Of reports that we could create, and we could create uh, a specific one for anesthesiologists. You know, so that their patients would understand. Yes, I am. I'm somebody who is sensitive to this type mm -hmm. of anesthesiology. Exactly. Or we could do one for gynecology, for instance. Um, there are some of those already out there for gynecology, but focusing the way we do on the chronic disease pieces, as opposed to the cancer pieces or the inability to get pregnant or something like that. Yeah. Like we, we can look at, there's a lot of different things. Again, from a family practice background, miscarriage risk actually is related to blood clot risk. It's related to your ability to clear toxins. There was a study in Ecuador. I don't know if, uh, if we're... We're seeing, making sure that we're still on, uh, yeah, yeah. We're still on break? Not, yeah, we're still on break. She can, she can talk. Oh, okay. Ahead. In, in but we may want to ask about that because in Ecuador, they did a study... Uh, there's a really good. We're ready to. Uh, to you tell us when we're rolling. Oh, okay. So, all right. So, uh, nothing. We were just. I just picked up the phone just to make sure that we were still. I was waiting for you to tell me for us to go again. All right. Now. So all right. So now. So we we've been rolling during that time. Oh. So isn't that wonderful? So That's we'll fun. just continue to talk. I know. Go ahead. Go with Ecuador. So instead. when we talk about something for like for gynecologists. One of the things as a family, as a family physician, mm -hmm. is we would look at miscarriages not only as fertility, you know, fertility issues in the same way that a gynecologist looks at them, but also because there can be blood clotting risks that contribute to miscarriages. Yep. Like if your platelets are too sticky or you make too much clots, those are known risk factors. But also as an integrated physician there's evidence that people who don't remove certain pesticides and herbicides and toxins well, that if they're overexposed, that increases their miscarriage risk. There was a study in Ecuador of a village that is a coffee growing village. And so it's a small village. The women there are almost all coffee pickers and they would spray the, the coffee fields aerially so that there's heavy doses of glyphosate, which is Roundup. And what they found is in the women who had a particular genotype, so particular DNA variants, two copies of it, which was found in about 12% of the population, if they were coffee pickers living in this village, they had five to eight times the risk of birth defects and miscarriages in their children mm -hmm. compared to people who were able to remove these toxins well. So helping people to understand these things about themselves is really important because there's stuff you can do. There's supplements, you can avoid the toxins, things that you can do to kind of help promote removal of those basically environmental toxins. Environmental so. exposure is really important and people do need to better understand the risks that they have. 
for macular degeneration, for instance, smoking increases your risk, uh, being Age. around barbecue. But also, if you live in a big city and you happen to, maybe you have a baby and you're in a stroller, you know, the baby's in the stroller and you're walking, mm -hmm. well, the baby's right at the height of the exhaust of all those cars. So there is a lot of exposure that's happening that we don't think to ourselves is gonna somewhere down the line create a problem, but it does. Sure. And so if we have an opportunity to educate, and Sharon and I think of ourselves as, edu as an education company, as educators, exactly. um, then we, we want to provide that information as well because <clears throat> everybody has the choice to decide how they're going to live. They may not be able to accomplish their goals immediately, but if they understand what options they might have or they might employ, then that's going to create better health. Yeah. And there's certain foods, like for uh, one of the detox pathways that can help with that glyphosates, uh, is uh, Brazil nuts in some people can upregulate that pathway. Just eating two to seven. Don't eat too many because selenium is toxic if you eat too many. Sure. But two to seven a week, so not very many. Um, or broccoli sprouts extract, which is uh, has something in it called sulforaphane, mm -hmm. can help with removing mercury, removing some of the pesticides okay. and herbicides and so again it's not something you might buy off the shelf every day but if you know you're in that 12 percent of the population that's at super high risk for inability to clear the different things even mercury that may change what you eat or how you respond to it mm -hmm. that's that's an extraordinary time so where do you see you got how are you how are you plotting and planning your your business your 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 education company because this is what you're doing you're educating physicians you're educating you're doing research and you're continuing to how, how do you how do you you spread because you're obviously growing you're obviously going to what what how do you think about that well uh, I think about it in a lot of different ways right now we're taking a multi prong approach we are going directly to the consumers in some small ways. Uh, discussing, providing opportunities for that educational component, and then providing an opportunity with doctors available for those people to come on board and decide if they want to take uh, take advantage of what we have to offer. So we do these talks uh, in communities and, and mm -hmm. provide the information. And then the other is to provide workshops and to attend and speak at different workshops around the country, which we do all year long, to clinicians. And uh, in fact, we have four coming up for the remainder of this year that we're plant that we will be attending, and then one that we've that we will be creating for ourselves as well. We had one back in May, and we'll be having another one in December. So it's a slow process, in part because genomics is a new field of medicine. Exactly, it's not being taught in medical school, and in fact, there's quite a bit of resistance about it being taught in medical that, school. And I'm fascinated with that that the part of the resistance as you're being a part of the leading edge of science. I think it's hard for a medical school to embrace a technology that their professors don't yet know. And so one of the things, whenever I have someone from a medical school that's interested, I will walk the professor or walk whoever's interested in it through the genomics, showing how it can make decisions regarding things that they're comfortable with. They know that a certain percentage of the population get muscle aches from statins. And I'll show them how it's certain genes that can affect the breakdown of the statin or genes that affect their muscle's ability to regenerate, um, or genes that affect CoQ10. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that Carol's talked about that I think that we would love to do in the future is eventually develop smaller reports because if you're not an integrative medicine practitioner or a functional medicine practitioner, it may be too much to deal with all these different topics. Absolutely. But if we can just get cardiologists comfortable with right. the cardiac interventions, and we did at our last training have a cardiologist and a cardiac nurse practitioner at our training because there is so much in our current genomics that relates to AFib and stroke and heart disease. But if we can do a smaller report for anesthesiologists, who is gonna need less of certain anesthesia or they're gonna not wake up well? who is going to need uh, different kinds of anesthesia or it can put them at risk for cognitive impairment. Um, so I think that that's one thing we talk about is doing specialty reports, but we also have our own passions. Um, the cognitive reversal, the reversal of cognitive impairment is one that we've already talked about because it can be but so devastating. But you can't talk about it enough because that is yeah. really, especially with the aging population, the boomers and all the, the those of us, it's an interesting process of, of having, of keeping the the brain fresh and and keep the interest and in the uh, I just think it's such a such a lovely mm -hmm. 
And, and it's so different because we have one professor who came to us and uh, a retired professor from UT and he already, there's a scoring system from one to 30 and um, mm -hmm. if you have a one, you're basically not verbal and um, very significant dimension, sure. 30 is completely normal. And he came to us at a 19, which was already mild uh, dementia. Sure. And he was able to bring himself in, though, because he's a bright, educated gentleman. Sure. And within four months, we had him back at a 26. Well, that's a huge difference. That's huge. Because we were able to kind of identify. He had huge mitochondrial factors, had huge problems with detox, uh, problems with other pathways, and so that were nutritional and, and various pathways. And we've had that kind of story over and over and over again. So that's one of our passions. Um, another one, uh, as we said, our head scientist from Australia uh, is uh, Dr. Heather Way, and she's an autism expert. She's already in Australia using genomics, reversed many hundreds of children from nonverbal to verbal. Can you believe that? Which that is, is, it's, it's, it's incredible. That, that, w when you hear stories like that, mm -hmm. what does that what, what does that do to you as a mother and as a as a? Oh, it's so inspiring and and encourages me to continue down the path that we've started. Because, you know, the bottom line is, if you have a healthy population of people making decisions to support one another, is that not what we want for our entire universe? Yes. And so, why wouldn't we go down this path? Yes, yeah. And, and that's just beginning. The research is not quite done, so we basically have it just kind of available right now in our office in Australia, and we're getting it to a place where we can release it to other doctors later in like 2020. Yep. But even just the ability, we had one young woman and we were using it, she's in her 20s, a UT student, and being able to help her better interact with her boyfriend by being able to adjust the fact that she didn't make enough oxytocin, which is kind of that hormone that women make when they have babies sure. um, for bonding, or that she w we were able to use her genomics to help make it so she felt more relaxed around other people, but also didn't have the sensitivity to taste. She said food went from tasting like gravel to silk after we adjusted things. Mm -hmm. So even these small differences that we're making in people's lives um, can be huge to them, and I think it's really what motivates Carol and I to work that eight days a week. Right. Yeah. Um, and something really exciting I just wanted to add is that you know, at the beginning, people would be coming in and telling us about their symptoms, but now we can look at their genomics and go, <laughs> I joke. bet you have this and this and this. And they go, oh, yes. <laughs> it's a good party trick. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and the, but at other times, they will also come in and we will discuss their genomics with them and ask them, are you having this difficulty? For instance, do you have difficulty with sulfuric foods or things like, you know, difficulty metabolizing this? And they go, I knew that about myself. I yep. always avoid that because it's so problematic for me. And that is extremely validating, creates uh. higher levels of compliance in the patient because they're excited that someone finally understands what's going they on. hear about it. Yeah, I, I watched this documentary on mountain gorillas and that they would go from one place to another. They would eat and then they would, but before they finish the foraging, they would move to the next, they, they, and, and that they actually balance their diet, mm -hmm. the, the blood crazy. that they did that they have. So it's in there. It's in that there. That sense is in there, That mm -hmm. but we, we, we are either in this overly sensual world of taste, and the, it's hard to, and, and, and inputs that we get. Exactly. It's, it's hard to stay sensitive to that, but if we do, then we know. And that takes me right back to that question you asked about the mind-body connection. With all those inputs that are not yours, you are overcome. Thank you. Thank you. And it's an overwhelming, it's an overwhelming place. I mean, what, isn't it wonderful to be in a, in a career and a life that you know that you will never run out of curious, amazing, <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> things to think about and work into? Yeah, we, we definitely agree with that. We actually joke with our, our whole team um, and we say, are you guys bored? Yeah. And we say, if you're ever bored, we're doing something wrong because uh, no one gets bored in the work we're doing. Th that's so exciting. So wh what do you look for in a great teammate? and a teammate when you're bringing, because as you continue to build out this team and this, what are the things that you look for in, in, in somebody that you're adding to the team? Well, definitely education has a lot to do with that. Um, and we're not necessarily looking for, the, for a whole host of PhDs, but we are looking for people who understand bioinformatics, who understand um, the connection between 
what's happening with these SNPs together, not just this one little piece and, oh, well, it can only be that. The person has to really be open-minded and understanding mm -hmm. that we're in the process of pioneering this field. Yes. It's not, it, we're not at the end, we're at the beginning. So when we look to hire people, we really look for people who are interested in helping us to pioneer. I think they have to be excited about what we're doing yep. because when they're on the phone, we give a lot of support to our clinicians. So when a physician or a nutritionist, because we also make a version for nutritionists because there are a lot of the ways that we can affect the human genome is with what we eat and supplements. Thank you. Um, but when we're teaching these nutritionists or teaching these clinicians, our staff needs to be enthusiastic. And so yep. we want them to be excited about what we're doing so that that translates because it does Everyone goes through a period of time when they're learning genomics, when they're like, I don't know if I can, you know, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. Of course. And we always kind of joke, uh, we have a saying. Genomics is hard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so, you. You're the, the, yeah, exactly. So, this so, is... so we look for team members that can get past that and yeah. um, that want to delve into the science and really make a difference. But we've been really, really lucky. We're in Austin, so at UT we've had a lot of our researchers, our research associates are yes. just smart UT grads that had been immunology majors or biochemistry, you know, done genetics and just really are like, wow, this is actually allowing me to use my science degree to help humankind. And well, so I wanna, let, let's do this because one of the things about Reasoning Spontaneous Conversation is that we are this reboot here is that we are taking what is happening wonderful in Austin and as I was talking to Clay Boykin, it's such a great uh, incubator it is. for what can be done in the entire world. There's a lot of thought and creativity and freshness here. And neither one of you, I certainly am not from, Houston, uh, from Austin, yeah. and, but you're doing it here. Yeah, it's, it, it really is a wonderful community. And I think a testimony to that is when Dr. Wei came over from Australia and she has been working on the autism report and we were talking about hiring a research associate for her. She actually had options of getting a PhD in Australia, doing lots of different options and she's like, you've had such great luck and have such great people on your team here in Austin with yep. your UT science grads. I'll work with one of them. Can I have one of them? There she wanted, you know. There, there you go. And, and, and it is, and it's one of the, one, one of the opportunities here. There's a real, uh, th there's there's such a strong I mean there's a strong uh, energy here there there uh, there is there is a lot of powerful women who are here who are in the, in so many of the, the, that's what I where I'm excited about I, I, I see what you guys are doing and how you're building this model up and I'm not sure that if there was a if one of you two were were a man uh, you know the testosterone model would, would, that you would. <laughs> <laughs> that you would that you would be building it in the same way that you are building it now. Well, I can I can speak to that just a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of people think that when you're a startup company, that the rites of passage are that you do step one, step two, step three, where you yep. get to venture capital, and then eventually somebody buys you out and you're out of your business. Exactly. That is not our goal. We love what we do. We want to be involved in what we do until we can't do it anymore. Yeah. And so we're, we're, it's not that we aren't interested in other people's input, but we're not interested in other people telling us what we have to do or yeah. how we're going to do it, and that they influence us because of their financial input. Exactly. So um, Sharon and I have bootstrapped this company uh, all on our own and are finally getting to a place where we feel like we're making some traction. And... Um, excited about that. We're super excited that we have led this particular uh, path and that we're making traction in a way that other people are starting to notice. And we, we're getting calls now because doctors are hearing from their patients, I've heard about IntelliX DNA. This is wonderful. Could you please do that for me? Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't get any better than it that. Doesn't. That's doesn't, exactly what doesn't we want. Doesn't that give you that? I mean, I, I, I think about that because if, if we cannot get pleasure during the process, you're never going to get it when the result comes in. If you, You've got to be able to enjoy it along the way. Are you having fun? Are we doing something meaningful today as we're going through the process, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, I love it. I actually do spend a lot of my weekends researching because it's when I have quiet time, but I'm like, oh my gosh, this helps us understand 
you know, what's going on in this particular situation. And I think I found a way for us to address this particular kind of, you know, microglial brain inflammation or whatever it is. It's exciting. And it, it's, it's really exciting. fun. There's new studies coming out all the time, too, and we just are constantly then able to kind of go and add more things. And I, I, that's one of the things that I love about the Internet because it feels like that we have actually connected in a way the the consciousness of humanity altogether because think about how quickly a peer review could get up there and you could her, le learn about it so quickly mm -hmm. that it would have taken 20 years ago. Absolutely. Well, it's still a slow process. I mean, the, the research that's being done doesn't usually make it into the mainstream marketplace until at least five years. And because is there any way to, sh to, to, to shorten that? Is that's there what we're doing. Do? That's, that's what, what we're, we're doing. doing. So we always say what we're doing is we're translating the research that was done by PhDs that's in the published literature right. and making it accessible to the people who are taking care oh. of patients, to physicians and nurse practitioners, naturopaths, you know, all kinds of different healthcare providers because most healthcare providers don't have time to go and read all the different journals. So that's yes. exactly what we do is say, oh wow, isn't this amazing that hydrogen water can help with yes. brain, you know, it's a, something that can help with oxidative stress in the brain and it matches up with this gene. Or isn't this amazing mm -hmm. that, you know, whatever supplement. What I, what I love because when, when I was growing up, uh, when I was growing up there was this alternative healing movement that got a lot of negative press because it was the oh it's woo woo it's uh, you know auras and changes and all that and you're putting the science to what right. that that was the undercurrent you're you're matching the science up to that well and people frequently would say to me so i started out being interested in alternative medicine when i was a medical student at harvard and actually got funding from Harvard to run a alternative medicine lecture series. And we had Bernie Siegel and Deepak Chopra and really sure. great um, leaders in the field. Um, so it, it was really great that we were being supported, but getting medical students and doctors to show up was really hard. <laughs> I mean, I would have to go to the hospital and invite the nurses because yes. I didn't want the amphitheater to be empty. Yes. And people would say, well, Sharon, you're, you're academic. Why are you doing this integrative stuff or alternative medicine stuff? Yes. And I say to them, you know what? This is the first time in medicine since I left medical school and left the research part of medical school that we're actually using the basic science to help humans get well because we're saying this works on mitochondria, this works on this gene receptor or this neurotransmitter or this transporter for a hormone. And so we actually will always tell our clinicians what you're doing with integrative medicine is the most academic form of medicine you can do. And, and I will really support that um, and, and can hold my own against most academicians. God. And you're so. finding the same thing in your in, in, in your research and your practice oh, and your patients. Absolutely. And what about the level of education of self education? Because one of the things that mm -hmm. I'm seeing is that we cannot sit down and go to the doctor and say, okay, well, whatever you say, doc. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like I got to be part of it. I got to bring, be bringing in. Right. Uh, well, we, you know, the people. In truth. Um, so Sharon and I each had our own practice and indi practices independently. Right. And when we realized that together we could create better outcomes for our patients. I was still in my own practice and she was in her own practice, but we were doing research together and, and bringing that forward. And so the reason behind that was because we were attracting those people who were so ill, they had to do their own research in order to get any help. And so they were looking for people who wouldn't look down on them and wouldn't tell them that they, you know, that they were crazy, essentially, mm -hmm. but that they really did have a bead on what was going on inside their own body. Yeah, I mean, uh, go figure. You, you have your own I'm body. You might know more about that mm -hmm. than somebody else. Oh. And so um, we took the challenge and, you know, we, we didn't just put our toes in the pool. We jumped in. And I see that, and that's that's what, what, what you're building. I mean, that, that, what I love about what you're doing is that you're empowering rather than prescribing. Absolutely, because mm -hmm. we really firmly believe that there is no way that a piece of paper, a genetic tool, artificial intelligence can determine what's right for Dennis. It needs to be yep. Dennis along with his 
physician or healthcare provider in a conversation regarding what's going to work for you. What do you want to do? Are you someone who is going to improve your growth factors for your brain by doing more intense exercise? Mm -hmm. Are you going to change what you eat? Or do we need to give you a supplement? Or do we just say, mm, if you don't want to improve it, it has a 2.7-fold increased risk you, of Alzheimer's, and that's up to you. And, and, you, know <laughs> you, know? The, and, and you know that. So that, that, that's fine. You, you, you can change the oil at 3,000 miles, or you can do it at 5,000 miles. That's exactly and, right. Yeah. Right. And so we, we built this to empower clinicians. But there's also no way that any clinician can memorize 600 or 1,000 different gene variants and what to do right. about it. So what we built is a tool that puts someone's DNA in front of their physician along with information about all the genes, along with information about what are potential ways that you can intervene or modify mm -hmm. those pathways. And what's really fun is the patient's response. One, mm -hmm. of, one of our patients said, I feel like I am working with my body instead of beating it into submission. I just thought that was fabulous. Oh. And another woman said, you know, I feel like I'm gonna be healthier in the second half of my life than I was in the first. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. That is huge. Mm -hmm. that, that is, is huge. huge. I, I, <clears throat> that's the thing that I love about um, your practice and both, both of you uh, uh, of what you're doing is, is that we can truly see some, some, some opportunities to where we've been bouncing up against this, this, uh, this, this model that we have of fixing people mm -hmm. and then of seeing what we're, we're, we're doing and actually being able to, to, to refresh and get, get, get that going and see where we're, we're connected. Yeah. We really love it. And it's, it's really, it's fun as well because like in our office, we have out of a few hundred patients, almost no one who has hypertension anymore. Because when you address mm -hmm. people's underlying genomics of inflammation, calcification, all these different things going on, and you help them kind of talk to their body and know what's beneficial, then the high blood pressure goes away. Um, so there's yep. so many different things like that. Blood sugar, I have one person, she has type one diabetes, so of course she's on insulin, but our type two diabetics never get to needing insulin. They barely end up needing medications. We end up using some medications sometimes, mm -hmm. depends on where they are again in that path, but again, when they understand their bodies, they're so much more able to control what's going on. So we really, yep. mm -hmm. we love what we're doing. When you're dealing with things like depression, or mm -hmm. you're dealing with uh, the, how how do you do you work with that? I mean, is there there's still role for talking therapy and and being I'm, I'm be, just being heard? Clay sure. Boyk and I Absolutely. on the previous, you Absolutely. know, the chance of being heard actually lifts that sense of, that I don't feel powerless. Right, right. Well, I work with a lot of people who have chronic pain. And uh, depression is, and, you know, something it that is it, it because just, that's a chronic pain does work. It, it does come uh, very strongly behind the the symptoms, and the chronicity of it is what sometimes creates the depression. Some people tend toward depression. I actually do tend toward depression, and I have to work at not allowing yeah. myself to go down that path. Sure. Um, and I do. I use my genomics to help me do that, but. The bottom line is every patient needs to be heard because until we understand what the experience is for them, we can't help them anyway. We can have a ton of data, but if we're not supporting that person where they live, it doesn't matter. Yes, and that, that's where I think that there's in this model, if we can get to the insurance to get into the model to where, like through nutrition, I mean, you've, you've given me some hope because mm -hmm. I've been a, a, a big, proponent of uh, of empowering nurses but now if I could see this if we could get to it through nutritionists nutritionists would have a lower barrier to uh, to allow people to be able to get into the heal th this healing modality right and then they can refer to a clinic a physician if it's something that needs a physician sure. um, but but it's still if you could get to 40% or six, you get to a large portion uh, of them, you, you could then, then. Well, nurses don't have the ability to prescribe. Right. And so. Um, even, even, even supplements? 
I mean, I know they can't prescribe supplements, but they can recommend. Can nutritious N nutritionists good? It could depends they? on the laws of the state. Mm -hmm. So nutritionists do work under physicians, and so there are some different laws um, depending on the state. Right. But I think that our goal is to work with whatever healthcare licensed providers want right. to work with us. So we we will not sell to somebody who doesn't have a healthcare license, but we have chiropractors that are doing a great job of working with patients that have cognitive impairment, which you right. wouldn't think would be mm -hmm. the typical chiropractic field, but if that's their I interest, um, mm -hmm. that's great. We have nutritionists, we have naturopaths, we have DOs, MDs, nurse practitioners, PAs. Um, again, the majority of our users right now have been integrative physicians. That'll be the allopathic model. Most of them are, right. I mean, I would say the majority are MDs and DOs, right. but it is expanding, and it just depends on who is interested in learning. Well, this is where, this is, this is where we're, we're, we're learning. I mean, this is, you are setting the stage for, can imagine in 50 years how this could be from the work that you're doing right. now. And our ultimate goal, so in order to get something approved as by insurance, um, you have to ha go through a, a series of processes. And we are just starting to have our genomics used in some studies. Dr. Dale Bredesen, who wrote the book, The Reversal, The End of oh, Alzheimer's, right. and mm -hmm. has really been a leader in the field of reversal of cognitive impairment, is using our genomics in a study with three of his co-authors and fellow MDs. Um, and so that's Congratulations. great. Congratulations. Thank you. Wonderful. Congratulations. And so really our goal is to work with people who want to do research. Dr. Wei is doing research on autism, and we're looking at some other collaborations in those fields. So if we get the research out there, uh, then we'll be in a better position when there's a lot of publications saying, look, if you personalize medicine using genomics, we're able to show that you get improvement in cognitive scores. Because we actually do test before and after in like every four to six months. But then it also, you can show, well, if you can avoid someone going into a memory care center, which can be like $60,000 a year. I know. Mm -hmm. Then, the, then mm -hmm. someone goes, okay, you know, you're going to spend 1000 or 2000 on genomics, depending on different factors. But it's going to be worth it because once they understand their book of you, then they can keep that user manual for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. All right. And... What else do we need to know? In the last in the last few minutes here, what we want to do is just to see what 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 are the things that I have not talked about, and I realize that we have talked about a tiny sliver of all the things we need to talk about. But talk about some of the things that are on that that that, that you think that we haven't talked about that would, might be on this particular time to be able to to share about either of you. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to pick a topic. Sure, it doesn't in, matter. In don't don't worry. It'll just be some topic uh, serendipitously dip into the well and pull something out. I think the one thing you had asked a question earlier that I'd love to circle back to, um, and about kind of some of the criticism of genomics. Yes. And one of the main waves, and kind of science goes in waves. One of the main waves right now is that we've realized that. Um, it's not only about your DNA, but your RNA, which is your, you know, how the DNA is what we call expressed. Mm -hmm. So DNA can be turned on and off. So some people are going, well, maybe we shouldn't look at the genomics. We should look at this RNA, what's turned on in the blood. And I think that one of the most important things to understand about that, of why we say, yes, that's a great tool, but it doesn't replace genomics, is realizing that your DNA doesn't change from the day you're born to the day you die, unless you you know, have some things go awry. Right. It's not really changing. And that if you look at blood, which is where you could get the RNA, you're missing what's going on in the brain, what's going on in the bones, what's going on in the heart muscles. Because the very interesting thing about DNA is DNA is turned on or off in different tissues. So we really have to go back to the DNA and match it with studies of the diseases and say, this DNA gene variant is it controls inflammation in the brain, and we know it's in the promoter, which is the switch that turns it on, and we know that this particular variant is associated with twice the risk of Alzheimer's. Well, then if you have that, you're going to go, well, we're going to want to address that particular kind of inflammation. So we're not opposed, again, it's very popular right now to look at metabolomics, mm -hmm. you know, the metabolism and the proteomics, the proteins in the sure. blood, and we're not opposed to that. 
But what we always say is it doesn't replace your genome because from one cell of your genome, from the DNA Intellix, Intellix DNA kit, it's a saliva kit, so you spit into a tube, and from the cells that are coming from the inside of your cheek, we get the DNA that is, can be turned on and off in your heart, in your bones, in your eyes, in your brain. And so it gives us so much information with a really accessible test. And so mm -hmm. that's something that we are, ex why we are dedicated to genomics. So. And, and your experience in this, in, in this, in this, did you see yourself as a business person? Did you see yourself as a, as a part of the leading edge of science? Is, is, has that been a dream for you, Carol? Um, I, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, I did see myself, I even as a that. young child, as somebody who was going to be bringing something forward that was very important. The what was unclear to me um, and actually frustrated me to no end for many years. But I think that having the path that I took, which seemed like it was doing a, a whole lot of different things as opposed to just one trajectory, brought me to this place. And frequently I'm standing back and I'm going, gosh, maybe somebody else should be doing this because, you know, I, I'm not this or I'm not that. But the reality is I'm the one here. And so I'm stepping into my shoes every day and, uh, and doing a great job. Thank you. That's what I agree with. I, 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 I love it because if, if we're not a little bit uncomfortable, then we're not trying hard enough. If there isn't some, if there isn't some idea of some opportunity of risk and of what do we not know, then and what do we want to learn and what we can, and that's where I see you going. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I feel extraordinarily responsible about the kind of information and the delivery of this information that we're providing. It's it's not for everyone. It really isn't. There are some mm -hmm. people who, you know, not that genomics wouldn't apply to everyone and create a better way of living but that some people are just not ready for it. It's not in their time frame right now. Right. And at the same time, there are a lot of direct-to-consumer products out there that provide information that may or may not be accurate. We don't know that for certain. We'd have to go back and test every single one, every mm -hmm. single product that's out there. We simply can't do that. No. But what we put out there, it's so important to me that we make sure that we're doing it with the highest level of accuracy and the highest level of integrity that because we're changing lives. Yep. We are not just playing around in the sand. We right. are changing lives. Yeah. And to me, I'm not I'm not willing to take that risk and put somebody in a bad place. I'm just not. Yep. But that's where the research is. That's where the science right. putting the science into this and this is why you're not you're not just sitting back looking about Oh come on, come on, Pfizer, uh, <laughs> buy us. And, you know, come on and and get us there so we can have that island in the Caribbean. We'd still be doing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Say, say fine. Say, all right, but we still we want that clause in there that we get a chance to we we get a chance to be our own people and be what 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 we're doing today. What a delight! It, it, I mean, it's it, I, this was so much of a learning process. Will people be able to see? The video. Would there be, could we have a link to that video so that so that people who would watch the program would be able to would be able to look at? Yes, as soon as we will have uh, access to that video for you guys pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Good. So, yeah. and, and when when you do, as you as you continue to do the education, as you I, I hope you'll come back and and tell us more about what you're <coughs> about the work that you're doing and the and the and the opportunities because it's it's very exciting to me. It's exciting to me to be, because this body is such a, I mean, the fact that life even happens mm -hmm. against the second law of therm thermodynamics, <laughs> it actually occurs and evolves and comes out, and the complexities and the majesties and the magic of the of the human body blow me away. The little bit I know as a non, as, as a non, just as yeah. a... No, it, it really is. Just yesterday, um, one of our other doctors in our practice brought me an article. So everyone always brings us things, which is wonderful. And she's uh, with a two with the mitochondria is what you know give people energy. Yes. But that's a big involvement in Parkinson's and showing that people who had problem with that CoQ10 that if they take way high doses, like 600 milligrams, and they had these two gene variants, 
they could do a lot better with their Parkinson's. And so the way we look at it is everyone needs their user's manual. I mean, if mm -hmm. something as simple as Thank taking you. more mm -hmm. of one or less, more or less of something can help, that's great. And then wouldn't it be great if we had our user manual at age two instead exactly. of at age 80? And, and, <laughs> and it's a wonder. And, and what I'd like you to do is to also to provide a quick start guide with it. You know, so that it isn't just all the fine print. You know, give me a few pictures and the ways of it. Because if we, as we could begin talking about this early mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and empowering mm -hmm. early and helping people to understand that this is, that this is uh, my, this, this is my vehicle, mm -hmm. that I'm getting a chance to do. And wouldn't that be t wonderful if it was taught in grade school? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's where I think that this opportunity is going to be able to come when when we're we're seeing what where AI is going to be going, where we're all going to get a chance to do. I was waiting for, you know, the end. <laughs> you had a perfect end. Okay, we well, have three or four minutes ago. Okay, okay. Perfect. You'll great. Need it. Great. But, um, we're over. Yeah. Okay. We have two shows. Okay. That was not the goal. <laughs>